All right, go ahead. Okay, so this is a series of lectures on um, the, uh, the so-called KT transition in two dimensions. And it's basically the question of a phase transition in a th very thin film of helium-4, the superfluid to uh, normal transition in, in, in such, a, such a film of helium-4. And so the, this lecture series will be three lectures. And lecture one, I will just talk about the basic stuff, you know, about vortices and two-dimensional superfluid film. And then the second lecture will be on um, the developing, well, and deriving the, Hamil the, the Hamiltonian of the free energy function that we will use. Second lecture will be uh, deriving what is called the renormalization group equations. And the third lecture will be on some of the um, consequences of the, of the theory, and in particular, the, 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 this, the measurable uh, quantity, which was actually a smoking gun experiment. Now, of course, I've got trouble with this, but I can, I'm getting old, my eyesight isn't what it was. So we, let's get started. Now, so the first slide is just a few references because uh, the, the work was done basically in the, the first three references. Um, and it was my first attempt at a problem in condensed matter physics. I started life as a, as a high energy physicist and I, I ended up as a postdoc at Birmingham University, which was one of the last places I wanted, wanted to be for various reasons, but turned out to be the best thing that could, best move I could ever have made because it was there that I met uh, David Thaulis and um, we, we did this import, this work together, which uh, won, won us the Nobel, won me anyway, the Nobel Prize, and it was half of what the Nobel Prize at Thaulis got. And so there, these three, the first three references are published in, in, a, in the journal of, the British Journal of Physics um, from 1972, 73, and 74. And then I went to, visited David Nelson Harvard, where we wrote this paper, this Fizrev letter in 1977. Um, and then the last two are um, long, tedious um, review articles. One is published in, in a book. And then there's a uh, long, tedious article in progress, reports on progress in physics. So, so let's get started. Now, the, que the question that uh, Thaulis and I um, at least mostly David um, posed was he David knew everything about everything about everything and so he was a sort of genius but he I was very lucky in that he took me under his wing and uh, posed this uh, <laughs> problem to me which was okay we had the, pro the problem was the, the, um, the onset of superfluidity in a, in a very thin film of helium-4. Now, the trouble with the problem was that the, in, within theory, theoretically, in such a system that should be no phase transition. And why is this? Well, it is because there is... In, in such a system, uh, there is what is called no long range order. Now, you may say to yourself, I think, you may say to yourself, well, so what? I mean, why, what is important about long range order? I mean, long range order is just, you know, if you have a magnet, is, is the fact that at, at low temperature, the, all the little atomic magnets line up and produce a microscopic magnetization. Um, and so 
the idea was due to um, Lev Landau in, in Russia was that the low temperature phase of a system had long, always has long range order, whereas a high temperature phase does not have long range order. And so the, the essential thing about a phase transition is the evolution of this long range order at low temperatures. Now this, of course, the, the theory in this, of this was not rigorous. There was one rigorous theorem uh, thing, and that was the solution to the two-dimensional Ising model, where this was this statement was certainly true. And so um, Landau basically just generalized this. It said, well, this has to be true in general for any phase transition. Um, and so he proposed this as a, as a general rule, which was accepted by essentially every physicist there was, except perhaps by David Thales, because Thales was, Thales was a, a sort of genius, um, which made him very difficult to talk to. But he, now in a, in, in a, if a system in two dimensions with continuous symmetry, uh, the XY model and, and the Heisenberg model and the, uh, what's it called, the um, spherical model, there is no, there is no long range order at any non-zero at any non-zero temperature. And therefore, since a helium, a thin film of superfluid helium uh, four can be regarded as being very similar to um, a, a thin film of um, XY spins or with two components and you know a continuous symmetry it is a rigorous theorem for, for a system like that that says there is no long range order at any finite temperature, non-zero temperature. And so the natural when you when you combine this with uh, Lev Landau's statement, then there was no phase transition at any at, in the system because it would never go superfluid, no matter how how much you lowered the temperature. But there was this experiment, well, more than one experiment actually. But the, this this experiment was particularly telling, and what it was was it took a, a resonant crystal and absorbed some helium-4 on the very thin film of helium-4 on the surface. Now, this film was only, you know, two, three atomic layers thick. It was really thin. And if you, you know, one, one, one's um, naive expectations would be that every helium atom would be stuck to the, to the, uh, the surface of the crystal. And when the crystal vibrates, vibrated, the helium atoms would move with the crystal. And so that the only thing that this absorbed helium would do would be to increase the mass of the re this resonating, resonating crystal and therefore would reduce the resonant frequency. Now, this is a very, now, so then the experiment was done. The, 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 the the horizontal axis, okay, it's basically you know, one over the logarithm of, you know, the, the pressure, gas pressure, you know, one of the gas pressure to the third power. It's basically, a, it's basically a measure of the amount of helium absorbed on the fill, on the, on the crystal. And the, the uh, vertical axis is just the reduction in the resonant frequency due to this absorbed helium. And assuming that every atom of helium, or mo molecule of helium, is absorbed, is stuck to the helium, the crystal surface, and when the crystal vibrates, all its only effect is that it, it increases the mass of the resonating body. And so the reduction in, in the resonant frequency versus the mass, amount of helium absorbed would be just the straight, the, the straight line because the, uh, the, the reduction in frequency is proportional to, you know, just the, uh, the change in mass divided by the 
the, the, the total mass. And so that would be the, the straight line there, the solid straight line. And so then the experiment was done. And it, you know, you can you simply absorb a, you know, a certain amount of helium on the crystal by simply in changing the pressure of the, uh, of the helium gas in, in equilibrium with the, with, the, with the crystal. And so by, by cranking up the pressure, you would get um, um, you know, more, more helium absorbed. And so as, if you assume that all the helium is stuck to the, vibrates with the crystal, the only thing this does is in, increases the, the mass of the resonating, the, the resonating crystal. And therefore, it should follow the straight, the reduction of frequency should follow the straight line. And the experiment was done. And sure enough, for low coverages, it does follow the straight line. But then, okay, this, is the, this experiment is at a constant temperature. And, but then once the coverage increases to a certain value, the, um, the resonant frequency of the crystal suddenly breaks away from the expected straight line. And, and so there's a big deficit. So somehow a lot of the helium is, is, seems to be decoupled from the crystal. It's absorbed onto the, on the surface of the crystal, yes, but it doesn't seem to move with the crystal. And so this needs an, because this needs an explanation because the simplest explanation for the fact that some of the helium doesn't, is not coupled to the crystal is if, if, if some of the helium goes superfluid so that the crystal simply vibrates and the, the, some of the helium remains motionless. I mean, that's, in other words, the helium's gone superfluid. But this means that this thin two-dimensional film of helium, helium-4, undergoes a phase transition. But there was this rigorous theorem which said that there's no long range order in the system because there is no long range order in a, in a system with the continuous symmetry in two, di in two dimensions. And co combine that with Lev Landau's um, hypo um, statement, then there should be no phase transition. But the exper this experiment clearly shows there is a phase transition. But look, there's a deficit here because the solid straight line is the expected um, behavior of the resonant, of the resonant frequency, but the experimental um, uh, uh, points say that no, the, um, there's not the, 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 the reduction in the resonant frequency is smaller than it should be. And this, 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 this sets in suddenly at some co a certain coverage. And therefore, this is strong evidence of a phase transition. And this evidence was, uh, paper was written by Chester, Yang, and Stevens in, um, in 1972. So, so this is the main experimental evidence that there is a phase transition in this thin film of helium-4. And so the problem that Thaulus uh, posed to the, this postdoc, who is an ex-high energy postdoc, i.e. me, was, can, we, can you explain this? Uh, so I thought, oh, well. Yeah. And he, you know, Thaulus suggested a few things, of course. Let me go to the next slide. And he suggested that we should look at um, vortices, because if you think about what's going on with helium, superfluid helium. So you start with a superfluid film of helium. And we ask the question, what excitations in this helium, in this film, can change the film from a superfluid into a normal fluid, you know, one that is, uh, 
you know, a normal viscous fluid which gets stuck to the to the substrate. And the only excitations that can do that are vortices. And vortices are exactly what you think they are. For those of you who have ever had a bath um, and you pull the plug out and watch the water drain away, you'll know that the, that the water, when it goes down the plug hole, goes round and round. Um, and what you're looking at there is, is, a, is a vortex. And so these, these are, are possible excitations in this helium film. Um, and they are the only excitations that can change the nature of this, this superfluid helium, this assumed superfluid helium film from a superfluid into a normal fluid, a normal, a dissipating fluid. And therefore the argument is that the vortices are the excitations which are responsible for, for a superfluid, for, for the transition, because a superfluid is a fluid with no free vortices. You know, no, no vortices can move um, and cause dissipation. See, the point is, suppose we have a, a system which is sketched on this slide. And we have, it's, there's a uniform superfluid flow, U sub S, you know, flowing from the top to the bottom. And of course, in a superfluid, this flow will, will, will happen, will, will, will not, nothing will, nothing will change this, this flow. You know, small, smooth fluctuations, they have no effect. The only thing that can change the um, dissipate the superfluid flow or you know, reduce the, the superfluid velocity would be a pair of vortices. One vortex, you know, with the circulation is let's say clockwise, that's the so-called plus vortex, and the other vortex with the circulation is anti-clockwise, that's say the negative vortex, the thing with the minus sign. And these two, if these two, if these two vortices are bound, are close together, then they're just, they, they will have no effect, you know, because they're just like some, uh, some piece of junk there. But if for some reason, the, 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 um, the anti-clockwise vortex with the plus sign moves to the left and the other one moves to the right and they eventually hit the boundaries or if you say these boundaries uh, you know, periodic boundary conditions. So then they go around the back. They sort of go around the uh, round the system, and then uh, annihilate each other at the back. And this process will reduce the superfluid velocity by a small amount. And the superfluid velocity will be reduced by, in fact, Planck's constant H divided by the mass of the helium atom. Time, divided by mass times L, the, the width of the system. And so this process, you know, could happen over and over again, where, where, where some vo little vortices are produced by thermal excitations. And so there's a, let's say there's a constant um, reservoir of, 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 of vortices. But if these vortices are free to move, then it will be a the system will dissipate. But if they're not free to move for some reason, then you could say the system is a superfluid. And so the that is the physical argument, really, as to why vortices are the excitations that determine whether the fluid is a superfluid or a normal fluid. If these vortex excitations are tightly bound excitations, so there's no net vorticity, no, these vortices are not free to move, then you can call it a superfluid. But if for some reason these vortices are free to move, 
they, they will move in such a way as to dissipate the, the superfluid velocity, no matter how small it is. And therefore, such a system, you'd have to call a normal fluid. So it's the, the properties of the vortices which determine whether the system is normal or superfluid. Okay, here's just a sketch of a of, of, of a vortex. Now, the superfluid velocity is proportional to the gradient of the phase of the so-called order parameter. And so this is a picture of a vo of a of you know of the flow of the vortex of the of the superfluid going round and round some point. Okay, and the total uh, change in the phase of the order parameter, let's say, as you walk around the system is say plus two pi. Okay, uh, no, this is actually a minor, uh, delta theta is, this is actually minus two pi. Uh, if, the, if, we, if we pointed the arrows in the other direction, we'd be up, that would be a, a plus vortex. Now, let's talk about the theory. Because as I was saying, the it's the the essential excitations in the system. Now, okay, let's back off a minute. We're thinking about the system as a you know we've got this thin film of of helium four, and it is basically a superfluid. And then the question is, as I said, is what excitations can destroy this, can turn the superfluid into a dissipated fluid, a normal dissipating fluid? And the answer was on these, on these physical grounds that I just discussed, of the presence or absence of vortices in thermal equilibrium. And so let's talk about, okay, so basically we should go into the, the, the theory of, of this, um, uh, you know, helium, helium film. Now, the, the helium atoms or helium molecules are bosons. And they're described by the usual Hamiltonian, which is second quantized form, you know, psi dagger, or psi, psi dagger is the creation operator, and psi, uh, psi itself, or psi hat is the, uh, destruction operator. And so the Hamiltonian is just written as the kinetic energy plus some potential energy. And of course, these um, operators obey commutation relations. Um, but that's the, that's the quantum mechanics. Now, the superfluid part of the helium atoms can be described by a coarse grained order parameter. In other words, suppose we take the, 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 the field operator, psi, psi hat, and just take the expectation, average this over some uh, small volume, you know, average over a volume or area, which is large, which contains a large number of helium atoms, but is a very is very small on a macroscopic scale. This 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 operation is called coarse graining, and so the the order parameter, the thing that measures uh, superfluidity, is this uh, classical variable, which you could call psi of r, which is the expert the coarse grain average of the destruction operator. And of course, far from a far from a vortex core. Okay, you think about it for a moment. If you have a vortex, it goes round and round some point. The fluid is circulating round and round some point. And the superfluid velocity, so the, the, the order parameter, this psi is a complex variable. So it can be written as the psi of r at position r, can be written as psi naught times a magnitude 
and e to the i theta, where theta is the phase, is a phase, right? And so, the, and the superfluid velocity at the point R is just h bar over m times the gradient of the phase. And now I'm not going to go through this, but what happens here is that the, remember a vortex, which we decided is important, is a, as I said, is a fluid going round and round uh, some point at the center. Because the, the velocity, of the of the super of the of the fluid at the center must uh, diverge like one of the distance from the center. At, but the, but when the the velocity of the flow at the, at the center is very, gets very large, the system doesn't like that. So it, it sort of throws up its hands as gas and says, no, I can't do this. Uh, it's cheaper to change it back into a normal fluid. And therefore, the center of a vortex is in a, reach, a small region of, say, normal fluid. And the, the superfluid is circulating round, round and round. Now, of course, if you now remember the order parameter psi is some you know it's just basically e to the i theta but this order parameter has to be single valued so if i take a walk around a circle anywhere in the system i'd better come back after after i've circled round and come back to my starting point i the the order parameter psi had better have the same value as it ha had when I started. You know, this is, we, I mean, physically we expect that this psi is a single valued quantity. Therefore, the circulation of the, you know, if I, the, the phase as I go round the center of vortex will change by a multiple of two pi, because e to the two pi n is just one, so in other words, the psi comes back to what it started with, which is what it, you know, physically what it should do. And therefore, the circulation, as you go around the vortex core, the phase of the order parameter can change by a multiple of two pi. And so we have some, um, all right, so here we are. Here's another picture. Let's think about the phase change around the vortex core. So this is a picture of a vortex. Here's, the, here's my core. And if I go walk around one of these circles, the change in the phase of the order parameter, when I start here and come around the circle, and it doesn't have to go around a circle, I go around any contour and come back to this point, the change in the phase must be an integer multiple of two pi. And then the nice thing about this is, this statement is it doesn't matter what, you know, where I take my contour and it doesn't even matter what the shape of the contour is. All I have to do is go wrap and close the center of the, the vortex core. And if I take, any contour which goes around the vortex, closed contour which goes around the vortex core, the phase can, can change only by a multiple two pi. So that the order the field order parameter, which is psi naught e to the i theta, must be single valued, which means that theta can only change by multiple two pi. And the lowest energy vortex is one with the vortex the change in the phase is, you know, two pi or minus two pi. And 
now. Okay, so of course the now what we need we need to do some statistical mechanics. So what we need to do is compute the energy of of the system divided by kt. You know, kt has got the dimension of energy and the h the Hamiltonian or the energy. So the h over kt is the dimensionless quantity. And we can write this as just um, the energy can be written as a half mv squared, right? Mass times um, the you know the square of the velocity. And so we can write so, but of course we're talking about a a, a system where we have some the velocity maybe varying. Um, with position as a function of position. So the total energy is just a half um, rho s with a naught here. It may or may not be a function of temperature. Okay. Uh, now remember this rho s naught is, is a parameter. It is not the the, the parameters got the dimensions of mass per unit area in two dimensions, but that's all we know about it. And then we have the, the you know, the integral of D2, you know, over the, over the, over the uh, system, the two dimensional system times V squared. It's just a half MV squared. That's all, that's the end. It's just kinetic energy. So Hamiltonian is very simple. Now the important thing is this superfluid velocity v sub s is is given by Planck's constants h bar divided by m the mass of the helium atom times the gradient of the phase, and so we can write this h over k t, which is the essential quantity for statistical mechanics, is a half k naught of t, some temperature dependent param uh, parameter with the appropriate dimensions. It's just um, h bar squared over m squared times the bare superfluid density, which may be temperature dependent, divided by uh, kt. That's this k naught. And so there's my there's my Hamiltonian divided by, of course, k naught, k, kb, k, Boltzmann's constant temperature. This looks like a very simple Hamiltonian with which you can do um, basically any calculation you want to, because if you want to ca cal calculate the expectation value of some, of some um, operator, all we have to do is integrate over every possible value of, of the, this phase theta. And it's just a, it's just a Gaussian a simple quadratic Hamiltonian. So it looks very, very trivial. Now, as I said before, it's clear that the vortices are very important. As the probability of a vortex will determine if the system is superfluid, which flows without dissipation, um, or dissipative, or normal fluid. And if there are free mobile vortices present in thermal equilibrium, then it will be a dissipated fluid. Because as I said at the beginning, you know, if, if these vortices are free and mobile, any, any imposing any superfluid flow, no matter how small, will cause the vortices to go, you know, the, 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 the vortices of one circulation to go in one direction and the vortices with the opposite circulation in the other direction, they go around the system, meet at the back and, and, and annihilate. And will re that, that process will reduce the superfluid velocity. Now, so what we want to do is ask, the first question we want to ask is, suppose we have a system of size L, a large system, of size L. 
and we know that after coarse graining, we, we get this, you have this order parameter, this complex order parameter, psi of r, uh, and then, of course, it's complex, so we get the complex conjugate. And the free energy divided by kt can be expanded, you know, in this form, where these a's and b's and things are um, really um, unknown coefficients. But what we do know is that this coefficient of this of the mod psi squared term will be negative because you know if we minimize this how this free energy which is the usual thing you want to do really what this tells you is that mod psi is um given in terms of uh, of a and b this little a and this little b and so therefore if we assume that this little a here has got the temperature is temperature dependent and it flips sign at some t naught now t this is this is standard uh, ginsburg lando mean field theory and t naught is a temperature much larger than the, the, the critical temperature or the onset temperature. So we can assume that this A of T is, is very negative. And so what we have is we have a, 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 a coherence length here, which is capital square root of capital A over the magnitude of little a. Capital A is just the coefficient of grab psi squared. Now, if we've got a, suppose we have a vortex, a unit vortex at the origin, then the fail, the phase is just plus or minus the inverse tangent of y over x. So this implies that the, 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 the energy of the vortex an isolated vortex somewhere in the, in the in the middle with the core somewhere in the middle of the system of size l is basically this 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 coefficient pi rho s naught times h bar squared over m squared times the logarithm of the system size divided by the sum uh cut up some some microscopic length scale a which let's say is the is the size the radius of the core of the vortex and then maybe there's some constant order one now the entropy what's the entropy because you know we want to do statistical mechanics so we want to calculate the free energy which is e minus ts so you want to know what the entropy of a single of an isolated single vortex is now the boltzmann entropy it's just Boltzmann's constant, k sub b, times the logarithm of the number of configurations. And how many configurations can there be? Well, it's obviously just L squared over A squared because A squared is the area of a, of a vortex core, and L squared is the total area, the, the number of possible positions of the vortex core of the vortex of the center of the vortex is basically just L squared over A squared. So in other words, the entropy of a single vortex is just 2K twice Boltzmann's constant times the logarithm of L over A. But remember the energy is also proportional to the logarithm of the system size divided by uh, this vortex core size. And so the free energy, which is E minus TS, is just this expression here, which is pi rho s naught times h bar squared over m squared minus 2kt times the logarithm of L over A. And if this quantity is positive, right, we're assuming that the logarithm 
that L over A is very large. And therefore, this log L over A, we assume is very, you know, say is very large. In fact, it goes to infinity as the system size goes to infinity. And so the coefficient in front of that will determine if this free energy is large and positive or large and negative. You see, if, remember, the probability of, of, the, of a vortex being present is just e to the minus f over kt. So if f is large and positive, this means that the probability of a vortex being present is basically very small, is vanishingly small uh, as the system size goes to infinity. But if the coefficient, the temperature is high enough, the free so that that the coefficient of log l over a is negative then the free energy is large and negative and therefore the probability of of an of uh, an isolated vortex is large you know it's order one which means very lot which means that the vo vortices will be present um at high enough temperatures where the where this coefficient is negative and when these free vortices are present the system must be cannot be superfluid must be normal dissipating and therefore the we expect that there will be a will be a transition but from a from a between a between a normal fluid and a superfluid at a temperature uh, T sub C, where KTC is approximately pi H bar squared times the superfluid density, the bare superfluid density, which is a parameter, remember, divided by 2m squared. But it's a it's a finite, it's a finite temperature. And, and so we expect that the temperatures smaller than TC, the prob probability of, of a vortex being present is vanishingly small. And if T is greater than TC, this, this TC, we expect the probability of a free vortex being, being present is, is of order one, is essentially one. In other words, it will be, they will be free vortices. Of course, this is just the physical argument. And um, we need to, 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 to make these hand-waving arguments into a theory we need to do a lot better and so the rest of the lecture uh, this lecture is really just talking about how to um you know can you figure out what the hamiltonian is of of a of an of a you know some some uh, configuration of vortices, what that energy is. Now, all right, so what we have here, so we want to calculate, first of all, we want the curl of the superfluid velocity, which we can write as, uh, basically it, it works out to be h bar over m, del cross de, del theta. Now this is not, this does not vanish because it it could be it must be equal to h bar over m times two pi times some integer and it's a vector pointing in the z direction normal to the film and of course stokes if we apply stokes theorem to this so what stokes theorem says is the integral of cur the curl of the velocity superfluid velocity over some area is just integral around the perimeter of the area v dot dl which is h bar over m times the integral around the um around a closed contour encircling the water score of grad theta dot dl but this is just h bar over m times 2 2 pi times an integer n which is characteristic of the vortex 
Now, this is what is called a topological um, 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 quantity because remember that this integer n is robust against um, perturbations. You know, if I if I sort of mess around with the, with the, with the, with the film, superfluid film, and I allow smooth fluctuations to happen, I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change this n. Don't, because this n doesn't care if there are bits of the film go normal. It doesn't care if the if the um, potential binding the fluid to the substrate, which I haven't talked about and I'm not going to talk about, is random or not. This this n is is completely robust to such. Um, to such perturbations. And so this is this n is actually it's a genuine non-imitation topological invariant. And it's simply the strength of the vortex, an integer. Zero plus or minus one plus or minus zero means no vortex, of course, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the this is the same thing. Now, so we've we we've sort of taken care of the vortex part, but of course, we can still have smooth fluctuations of, of the system where the the phase simply um, wobbles about and doesn't um, change dramatically as it, as it go around some closed contour. And so I can always add in a, the, the superfluid velocity can also have a term describing the smooth irrotational flow and call this you know the gradient of, of, of phi some smooth some smooth phase. Okay and so the total superfluid velocity is h bar of m grad phi plus the bit due to these vortices, which can be written as two pi h bar over m times z hat, which is a unit vector normal to the film, cross the gradient of this, the total vorticity, which is basically just the integral d to r prime, n of r prime, this is an integer valued field, times the Green's function. Which is just okay, and of course the Green's function. If I take the um, the Laplacian of this whole thing, you know, I take the curl of the of the of, of this of the of this um, this 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 whole um, equation. I'll end up with the fact that the del squared of g must be called delta r minus r prime. And if you solve this thing, and because the simplest way of solving a differential equation like this, this is just take the Fourier transform and look at this thing in, in, in Q space. And then you can, you, you can, it becomes an algebraic equation and um, you can invert it. And when you invert it, this G of R, R and R prime is just the logarithm of mod R minus R prime divided by some cutoff. Actually, that th this should be the, the, the system size, but we wrote it as just A and of course plus a constant, some constant. Okay, this is just the um, oh, this is just a little bit of fiddling about to look at what the uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, looking at the the curl of z hat, which is unit vector, 
cross the gradient of, of, of some scalar. And this is just the, this is the Laplacian acting on the scalar F times this unit vector Z hat. And we, you can, and of course the delta function, this two dimensional delta function has just got the properties that if I take any function of R prime, multiply the two dimensional delta function of R minus R prime and integrate over R prime, I'll get, I'll pull out the value of the function at the point R. That's just the definition of two dimensional delta function. And of course, here we have the. We ju just look at the. Uh, all we're doing here is we're checking that uh, we, we, the, the calculation consistent. So we write down the velocity superfluid velocity due to the vortices, and it's just this expression here, which looks a bit complicated. Then we need to calculate the curl of this. And we calculate the curl, and uh, you know a little bit of algebra, and you get this n del squared g. And so this immediately tells you that the del squared of this g of r minus r prime must be the two-dimensional delta function of r minus r prime, so that the curl of the velo of the super velocity at the point um, at r is just h bar of m times two pi times this integer value field n of r and points in the z direction. Okay, now this is the last slide because this is some of the, uh, the end of the nasty mathematics. So what we have, let's summarize what we've got. We've got the Hamiltonian, which remember is just the kinetic energy. And that's just the kinetic energy of the film. This V sub S, remember, is a, it's a superfluid velocity. And this rho S naught is, is a density per, in a mass per unit area. So it's an aerial density. And we, we've argued that this superfluid velocity be written as Planck's constant divided by the mass of the helium atom times the gradient of the phase. So that this Hamiltonian over KT can be written in this apparently very um, innocuous looking, looking expression. But remember, this gradient of theta squared is actually uh, periodic. It's actually, it actually is a, a function that's periodic in two pi. And the end result of this is that we can write the superfluid velocity as h bar over m times the gradient of phi, of phi which is some smooth um, part of the phase, plus the bit due to vortices. And this can be written as in this rather complicated looking form. But this Green's function is, a, is just basically a logarithm. And so the total Hamiltonian divided by KT can now be written as in this form. So we've got a term half K naught, which is which is a temperature dependent parameter, the integral of grad phi all squared plus two pi squared times K naught. Now it's important that this, this parameter K naught here and this parameter K naught here they're the same times the integral because a triple integral we've got the vortex density at r1 the vorticity at the point r2 times the gradient of the green's function which is just remember the green's function is the logarithm of r minus r1 dotted into the gradient of the green's function r r2 and Import, very importantly, there are no cross terms. Now, the reason why there are no cross, I mean, you could imagine that there's a cross term 
we we have a term with a grad one grad phi and one grad g to so grad phi dot grad g grad g and with some vorticity as well but there is no cross there is no cross term in the in this system and that's important i'm not going to show you why the cross term vanishes but it's pretty simple actually you i'll leave that as an exercise for yourself um for you uh, because it's not not difficult to convince yourself this cross term does vanish but it's important that the cross term vanishes you you, you can argue it by saying look what this this superfluid this vortex part of the superfluid velocity this this uh part due to the vortex is that this bit due to the vortex corresponds to a vortex of minimum energy so it's a local it corresponds to a vortex with a local energy minimum and therefore since you could say that this the 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 compl this second term is nastily and complicated term which is an integration over all vorticities and these gradients of two grains of Green's functions. That is the expression for the local minimum energy. Of course, there are vortices which with the superfluid flow, and of course, they've got energy. But you can imagine that there's a certain flow which corresponds to a minimum energy, a local minimum. And this grad phi, this set, this first term, grad phi squared term, are just fluctuations, smooth fluctuations about this local minimum. And that's, if you like, is the reason why there are no cross terms. It's also not hard to to show, to, to to demonstrate to yourself mathematically that there are no cro cross terms. But the under, so as I said, the underlying reason. It's because this expression two pi squared k naught integral blah 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 corresponds to local minimum of energy. It's not an absolute minimum; it's a local minimum. And this 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 grad phi squared term adjusts the energy of smooth fluctuations, smooth deviations from this local minimum. Okay, now that's the end of the first lecture. What we've done here is derived the starting point. And the starting point for the vortex theory of superfluidity is this disgusting expression here. But remember, it's not that disgusting because really all it means is that, as I said, the second term is the vortex vortex interaction. And this we can fiddle about with a little bit and we can conclude that this is do this is basically just uh the integral of, over r1 r2 of n of r1 n of r2 times the logarithm of mod r1 minus r2 divided by some cutoff plus some other terms which ensure that the total vorticity of the whole system has to be zero. If you like, if you like, you can say that this horrible looking expression is simply the Coulomb gas, the, um, the, the, the interaction energy of positive and negative charges interacting with the Coulomb interaction. And this Coulomb gas consisting of you know uh, positive charges and negative charges has to be neutral. So the total vorticity has to be zero. The total vorticity in the whole system has to be zero, which make which makes sense. Because remember, right at the beginning we argued that 
if we calculate the energy of an isolated vortex in a in a system in a system that this energy of an isolated vortex proportioned proportion to the logarithm of the system size divided by the core the, the core size l over a and it diverges and that implies that free vortices i mean to, you know the, the the total vorticity of the system the whole system should it has to be restricted to be zero so the statistical the, the problem now is this to calculate the statistical mechanics of a neutral plasma of positive and negative charges in two dimensions. And so that is the problem that we will look at in the next lecture. So that, that's the end of the first lecture. And I'm essentially right on time. So the second lecture will be on what, Tuesday? Yes. Tuesday next week, right? At, at the same time. Yes. It's and a, then we'll, the last lecture will be on the Thursday. Yes. Next week. Okay. Uh, thank you. Questions. Okay. So uh, uh, the the talk is, uh, the lecture is open for questions. And uh, uh, Professor Drew will pick uh, questions from the Chinese audience. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Drew. Uh, yes, uh, I, well, I think there's the time lag between Zoom and uh, uh, Koshyung platform, so maybe we can wait a little while for questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, uh这个扣响的大家可以呃直接打字呃包括中文或者英文都可以这个呃进行提问，我可以把你们的问题转述给这个呃Costa uh, well, but before that, maybe I can ask one simple question if uh, oh. it's okay. Uh, so I'm just curious that uh, because these vortices, they have uh, this topological number, how they can be created during this process that we like increase or decrease the temperature? Okay. All I did was I simply calculated the energy and entropy of a single isolated vortex in, in, a, in a system, say, size L, right? Yeah. And, you know, I argued that this is proportional to the logarithm of the system size divided by some uh, microscopic parameter, say, the, the core size of a vortex. Mm -hmm. And if the temperature is low enough, is sufficiently low, this, the coefficient of the logarithm of L over A, which we're going to say in the thermodynamic limit is infinite, is, is positive at low temperatures, but at high temperatures are negative. So that the, the free energy at low temperatures is always large and positive. Therefore, the probability of producing an isolated volume <laughs> is, is essentially zero at low temperatures. But at higher temperatures, the probability of producing an isolated vortex, which we will then interpret as a free mobile vortex, right? Is the probability of producing those at, at high temperatures is one so that they are present at higher temperatures. Therefore, and when these mobile vortices, you know, free mobile vortices are present, the system dissipates. Yes. And therefore it's normal. It's not a superfluid, it's a normal fluid. But at low temperatures, isolated vortices, are, the probability of an isolated vortex being present is zero in the thermodynamic limit. And therefore, that's a superfluid. Because the only excitations that can dissipate the superfluid is a vortex. And if vortices are not present, it's a superfluid. That's the argument. Mm -hmm. And so the question now is a technical one of doing the statistical mechanics 
of this array of vortices. Which is, which is of course non-trivial, but remarkably, it produces um, an exact measurable, an exact measurable prediction. And experiment confirms the prediction. So that is, you know, so the, it was actually worth going through all this, this stupid algebra and going through all the uh comp, you know the difficulties of the of this doing stoichiometric mechanics and so on because ultimately when do, we do come up with a basically i guess what is called a smoking gun prediction which is actually measurable mm -hmm. and you know the whole and the thing is that this prediction is within within our theory and any minor modification of the theory is inescapable. You can't get away from it. And therefore, if experiment confirms the prediction, then the theory is almost certainly correct. But it can also, the experiment can also um, uh, nullify the theory, just say, no, it's not right. Because the theory eventually comes up with a measurable prediction. And this prediction is a smoking gun prediction because within the vortex theory, it's inescapable. You can't, you know, you can't change it. I see. That's really what we're aiming for: is to is to is to is to demonstrate this uh, um, smoking gun um, 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 prediction. There's not many theories that that have a prediction like that. That's why why this 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 uh, theory actually uh, got me a uh, my share of Nobel of two Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I I don't see any questions so far. So maybe uh, because it's a first lecture, it's uh, it was quite clear enough. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, actually, the, mm -hmm. the the whole thing is is not that difficult as long as you. Uh, but if you you know at some time during the calculation you get confused, um, of course, then uh, you know you, you can go crazy, but. If you can keep your mind together, it's not that difficult. Yeah, I think it's uh, totally possible for undergraduate students to understand all these uh, mathematics, right? Uh, well, most, maybe of, well, most, of, most of the mathematics is fairly simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when we get into the so-called uh, renormalization group, this, this 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 idea of you know of scaling and things it's yeah. perhaps that gets a little bit more sophisticated some yeah. of the ideas get a little bit sophisticated yeah and that will happen uh, in the next lecture i believe oh uh, yes yes <laughs> yeah because this is just the 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 the, the, the fun, you know the basic fundamentals of it uh, you know, setting up the, the theory. There's the next lecture will be discussing some of the, uh, you know, analyzing the theory a bit, bit more. Okay. All right. So um, if um, uh, there are no uh, questions from the Koshang Academic uh, Platform in China side, uh, then let's thank Professor Kostlis for the first wonderful lecture. And then we will see everyone at 9 a.m. on July 13th, uh, which will be the 9 p.m. Uh, of July 12th in the United States time. Okay. Right. And it is quite late now uh, for Professor Kostlis. Let's thank Professor Kostlis one more time. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's past my bedtime. <laughs> okay. 
All right. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So, okay. so we will we will stop recording and then we will end the talk here. Okay. Okay. Thank you.